uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Gay Raniella, and uh, this is a tutorial to decorators. Uh, you'll learn how to use decorators to write more effective Python code. And first off, let me just say that uh, we had a small mishap during the recording of this tutorial. So the first 10 minutes or so is a re-recording of the actual tutorial that was held um, at PyCon uh, on May 12th. Uh, but uh, after about 10 minutes, we'll be back in the original recording. So you'll see the full thing. Uh, so uh, let me then just go to talk a little bit about uh, who I am and what you can expect from this tutorial. So my name is uh, Geir Aniella. I live in Norway, in Oslo, where I work as a data scientist. I also do write some articles at uh, realpython.com, including an article about decorators. Uh, what we're going to do today is essentially touch decorators ourselves, get to see how we can uh, write decorators, how they function, and more importantly, how you can use them in your own code. And uh, the way that we kind of uh, have structured this tutorial is that I'll be doing quite a bit of coding uh, live in, um, in a REPL. And uh, the idea is that we'll try to do this um, together so that you can follow along in your own, uh, on your own system. And then in between, we'll take a few breaks and we'll do some exercises. So there'll be seven exercises uh, where you'll have a couple of minutes to uh, to try things on your own, and then we'll kind of uh, co collect us uh, all up together afterwards and discuss the solution for this. Uh, I also want to say that you're free to ask any questions you have uh, during the tutorial. Uh, use the chat, use uh, unmute yourselves, and uh, and uh, join in if you want. And one final bookkeeping note is that there is also all of this material, the slides, and uh, so on will be hosted on my GitHub page. So you can go to github.com, uh, GA Yella, uh, the creator's tutorial, and, uh, and get all, all of this code as well. OK, uh, so let's dig into what are decorators. And uh, I'll start with sort of like a motivating example um, uh, just to show you how does a decorator look. So, so for this first example, uh, that there's not really any reason to code along with this. This is just to show you um, how what, what a decorator looks like, essentially, uh, to get an idea of uh, what they are. And uh, I'll do that first, and then I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what decorators can do. Uh, so uh, this will be um, sort of like a small dummy example, um, as will most of the examples that we do during the tutorial. Uh, partly just because I want to make the points clear, uh, but um, I'll, I'll try also to talk a little bit about how, how this will work also in more real life um, decorators. Uh, so for this one, I just want to define um, a function that is typically slow when it does some calculation. Uh, to keep it simple here, I'm just doing a very basic calculation. I'm just squaring a number, uh, but I'm also uh, adding a time sleep here just to make it slow, just to show you, uh, to, to kind of uh, do a kind of simulate um, a, a long running calculation. So say that we're sleeping for a number of uh, seconds, uh, something like this. Um, and then we actually do the time dot sleep here uh, for the number of seconds, and then we'll return this number squared, squared. Um, so here I have a function, and if I call it, uh, you should see that it's running slowly. Ah, yeah, I see I did a small typo there. Uh, so let's just go up and fix that. This should be an F string. Okay, uh, so then if we run the slow square function, we can see here that it's sleeping for three seconds, and uh, then it returns the number. And uh, even if I call it a second time, it's still a, a slow function. So, so one of the decorators that are in the standard library is one called an uh, LRU cache, least recently used cache. And what that can do is to take calculations like this that could be long running and, uh, and just cache them. So remember them for later uh, if the result won't change. Uh, so just to show you how 
that one can be used. Uh, we can import that from the Funk Tools library. Uh, and then uh, we can now uh, go here and let's see, uh, essentially redefine our, or actually we don't need to change our function at all. Uh, we only add in on top of it, uh, what's called a decorator, where I just referenced the Funk Tools LRU cache. Uh, so I didn't change the function at all, which is uh, an important point here. Um, but what happens now if I call my slow square three, you can see that it's again sleeping for three seconds uh, before it's returning the number. But now if I call it a second time, you can see that it, it immediately returns. And you can also see that it doesn't print out anything, which means that the function itself didn't actually run. Uh, the only thing that happens was that this LRU cache somehow remembered the result, the output from last time, and just um, gave that back to us immediately. Uh, and to kind of finish up this example, uh, notice that if I now ask for the square of a different number, uh, it will again need to do the full calculation, so it will be sleeping, but then once it's run once, um, it's again cached. So um, if we're looking at this uh, as a decorator, uh, the important thing is kind of this line. So first of all, you can notice the syntax. Uh, so how you uh, uh, use decorators is that you use this at symbol and then the name of, of the decorator immediately preceding your function definition. And typically for most decorators, or possibly all, uh, you, you don't need to change your function. That's kind of one of the big powers of decorators is that they can be reused over many different use cases. So in this case, we had a slow square function, but you can see how the same caching function can be used in many, many different um, functions that you want to uh, have a cache of. So uh, what this kind of helps you do is then reuse fun functions, but you can also see how this makes our code much more readable. So say that if we didn't use the decorator, but we still wanted to cache a result, that would mean that we would need to kind of define code for doing the caching inside of the function itself probably. Um, so then we would kind of uh, litter our slow square function with extra stuff that just need to be there for caching, not because we need to do any calculations. So by using the decorator, we're kind of moving all of that fluff out of the function so the function can focus on what it does best and we kind of increase the readability of our code. And uh, yeah, so together with this, we get readability, we get more efficient to write code essentially because we can just reuse stuff all the time and we don't need to repeat ourselves. So if I wanted to cache a different function, I just reuse the same decorator. I don't need to include that code. So in this way, we get very elegant uh, code, essentially. Okay, uh, so uh, what are decorators? And let me just show you here that if I just type func tools LRU cache, uh, you can notice here that uh, our decorator is actually just a function. So that, that's kind of our first thing we probably should notice is that a decorator is really just a function. Uh, there, there's nothing magical you need to do when you're defining it and so on. Um, it does need to follow certain conventions that we'll um, talk more about. Uh, but in general, a decorator is just a function that we apply in a special way. Uh, to really understand um, what these decorators do though, um, we should talk about something uh, we, we typically call functions are first class objects. And um, what this means um, is just that we can treat functions as any other uh, kind of object in Python. So meaning that we can assign uh, functions to variable names, uh, we can pass them around and so on and so on. Um, so just to show you uh, these things, um, you could for instance, uh, define a variable that I'll call skriv ut. Um, that I'll say just takes the value of print, where print here is the print function. And skriv ut is Norwegian for print. So essentially, this is just the start of uh, translating Python into Norwegian in some sense. Uh, 
now I can use this. First of all, we can see that this is my built-in function print, and I can now use this to, uh, to actually print stuff. So uh, maybe not nothing revolutionary here, but what I'm doing is that I'm using um, the fact that functions are first class objects, I can assign them to different variables in Python. We can also uh, pass functions around. So uh, let me just create a very simple function. We'll, we'll play with this function several times uh, throughout the tutorial. Um, but it's a greeter function, uh, which I'll use essentially just to say hi to uh, hi to a given name so something like uh, this and the one thing you should notice here is that i did something right there where i said that uh, the argument printer uh, i give the default value of print uh, the print function and if i now just call uh, greet pycon uh, you can see that it again prints out high PyCon. So what happens here is that with the greet, uh, it calls printer, but printer is just a different name for print. So therefore this ends up saying print high PyCon. Uh, but now that I am have a, defined myself a parameter here for, for the printer function that I'm going to use, I, I can pass in different functions for this. So say I could define now a function that I'll call nerp. Uh, so nerp is just print backwards. So what this thing does is that it just takes a text and it prints out the text backwards. So I'll just reverse my text like this. Uh, and now I have the nerp function. And you can see now that if I do greet PyCon, but I'll specify that I want to use the NERP as my printer. You can see here that it actually prints things backwards. So what I've done here is that I've now been using a function as an argument to this thing. And the whole functions are first class objects in Python thing is something that uh, typically you'll have two reactions to this. Uh, it's either, yes, of course you can do this, or it is something that potentially blows your mind a little bit. And in the, the, the latter typically happens if you come from some languages where this is not allowed. So, so there are uh, many languages where functions are very special objects that you can't uh, do these kind of things with. Um, but uh, the, the power of doing this um, is that you can do a lot of uh, type of meta programming and those kind of things. And we'll see that this is kind of what allows decorators to function. Uh, before I move on, I also want to make sure that there's a very important distinction uh, when we're talking about functions uh, that I just want to make sure that everybody is aware of. Um, so in Python, you can refer to a function uh, just by typing out the name of the function. Uh, so here I just type print, and you can see that this gives me a reference to the function print. Uh, I could also use parentheses with print, and you can see that this seemingly doesn't give me anything back. And when you use parentheses after a function, you are not referring to the function, but you're calling the function, and it gives you a reference to the return value of that function. So. Um, in the case of print, print returns none. So it just gives you a reference to none, which is typically not very useful. Um, but this is important when we're passing things around. And um, uh, if we just remember here, when we uh, last used greet, notice that I um, uh, I passed in NERP without the parentheses as my printer. It's because I need the reference to the function. If I had here, uh, then a function call with the parentheses, we would see that we get a uh, an error message. I have this first one is because I don't have anything uh, there. Let me let me use print as a different example because NERP needs um, needs one argument. Um, but if we do this with print, 
you can see here that we get a somewhat mysterious reference to the non-type. And what happens there is that our printer, let's just do the call right here. If I do this, uh, then we can see, I need to force it out, uh, that printer uh, becomes none. So uh, this definition here just means essentially that I'm saying that printer equals none, and then it tries to use none as a function later. And that's when we get this none type object is not callable. Uh, so that's kind of where I get into trouble there. But yeah, the important thing is just to remember the distinction between print or any function uh, without parentheses gives you the reference to the function while with parentheses uh, calls the function and gives you a reference to whatever is the result of that function. Okay, uh, I see there's a question here too. Uh, is there a way to identify decorator methods available in Python libraries and the actual methods? Um, so uh, I don't think there's sort of like a, a global way to identify decorator methods because decorators are really just, as, as you'll see soon, they're just regular functions um, uh, that kind of follow certain conventions. Uh, but there are, and I'll uh, share a share a link with you afterwards. Uh, there are certain places online, essentially, that just c collected all of the different decorators in the stand library and, and in other libraries. Um, they're, of course, not complete, but at least they give you something. OK, uh, let's see. Then we have, uh, yes, uh, I wanted to show this other example where we can create a function kind of dynamically. And uh, this is often just called uh, a function factory or something like this, that you have you have a function that creates another function. So therefore a factory. Um, and in this example, uh, I'll kind of be similar to the greeting example in some sense. Um, but here you can see that I am defining a function within the other function. Um, so this is also called an inner function. And uh, I'm just defining here a function I call prefix printer. Uh, again, I'll just reuse a simple print function here where I'll take a prefix and kind of print it in front of a text. Uh, something like this. Uh, and then my prefix factory is just returning this prefix printer function. And uh, as I'll show an example first, and I'll explain a little bit more how it works. So let's say that I'll do a prefix factory um, where I'll use debug. And when I do this, uh, this debug, you can see here is a function. Um, there's some more information here that it it is actually the prefix printer function. That's a local function to prefix factory. But the important thing for us is that debug is a function. And if I use my debug to say, hi, PyCon, you can see here that it essentially then adds in the debug prefix in front. And what is kind of interesting here is that the debug function only takes in the argument text. And then the prefix argument comes from the outer function. So this one is kind of passed into, or really it's available to the prefix printer to use. And um, this is kind of something called uh, that it's getting the prefix from the enclosing scope that um, uh, prefix doesn't exist inside of the prefix printer function. So then it kind of looks outside to see if it can find it. And then it finds it in the enclosing function. Um, and in this way, we can create many different prefix printer functions where debug is just one of them. Uh, so, so what we're doing here is kind of the opposite of what we had in the previous example, where this time we're returning an example. Sorry, we're returning a function. And uh, then just to kind of complete the circle a little bit there, I can now call my greeter that we had earlier and send in my debug as the printer. And in this case, you can see that the greet now is able to take in the debug and, and print things out here. 
Um, I realized that I should also be copying a little bit just to make it easier for you to see that um, these functions that we have been doing. So I'll just copy these out uh, so you can kind of see them in the background. Uh, let's see, I have the NERP. I'll add in that one. And let's see. There we go. So um, also one thing to uh, just point out here is that um, every time, so, so the prefix printer uh, was kind of, uh, that function is only generated when the prefix factor is called. So uh, when, whenever you kind of call the prefix factory, a new function has been created. But um, uh, so, so there can be many prefix factory functions, essentially different versions of this. So yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, so what's next? Now I want to just put these things that we've seen now uh, together and have some, um, some function where I can pass in a function and it will return a function to me. And that is really the definition of, of a decorator as, as we'll soon see as well. So now I'll create a reverse factory, I'll call it, which can take a function. And then inside of here, uh, I'll just define another inner function that I'll call the reverse caller. It takes some text and what it does then is that it just calls uh, the given function. So the one that we get in there, uh, but I'll, I'll pass in the reverse text. So this is kind of a little bit like what we did here with the, this NERP function. And uh, it, it's kind of mixing these together. Uh, and then my factory uh, again should return this inner function. So it's creating a new function and returning it. And then what can we do with this? Well, I can, for instance, create myself a reverse print function uh, from using the reverse factory um, on print. So let's see what that ends up doing. So if we say our usual high Python, uh, you can see that this function is exactly like the NERP function here did. And if we kind of trace through here, we'll see that we are really doing the same thing, right? Because the reverse factory, I'm sending print in there as func. It's defining a function here where it's calling, in this case, then print of text uh, reversed, and then it's returning that function. So reverse print is really, at least functionally, the same as the NERP function. Uh, that means that I should be able to also reverse my NERP function um, by doing the following. And now, what should we expect the reverse NERP to give us? Well, that will reverse something that's already reversed. So that will just come back straight again. And then as a final little thing, and I can see if this one uh, becomes what you expect. So we can also reverse our debug function. And if we do then the reverse debug, of high PyCon. Um, so remember that debug was essentially using this prefix factory. Um, so uh, what will happen when we run this? Uh, if I, I was, I ended up slightly confused that it actually prints debug the correct way. But again, if we kind of trace our way through everything that happens here, um, but we'll see that uh, that kind of makes sense because the only thing that is reversed, if we look here, is, is the parameter text that we pass in here, right? So all the way through, we can kind of uh, run this. And in a sense, there's nothing really new about uh, what we have been doing here. Um, 
we're just kind of passing the functions similar to these examples that we've done here. But what we have actually done now is that we have created ourselves uh, a decorator. Uh, so this reverse factory is a decorator in the sense that I can uh, just add it at, using the same syntax that you saw for the LRU cache. So let's um, here just I'll I'll recreate the greet function, but just an even simpler one. Uh, so if we do something like this, uh, so I'll greet PyCon, and now if I just add in the reverse factory on top, uh, and then we greet PyCon again, you can see that it has actually uh, done the uh, done, done the application that it, that we wanted it to do on on the greet function here. You can see this is actually not exactly the same as the reverse print since again we are just reversing the uh, the parameter. So it says hi is correct, but then no no sleep or pycom is backwards. Um, so this reverse factory is actually our um, first uh, decorator. And I'll just gonna copy it, uh, and then I will. Let's see, there we got the code for it. Um, and let's see. There we go. Um, and then let's see if we can figure out what did this at reverse factory actually do for us. So when I'm doing this. Uh, this is really just syntactic sugar, as it's called, uh, the at reverse factory. That just means that uh, whatever happens here is something that we could also do without using the syntax. Um, it's just some extra that the language has uh, created for us to make things easier. So how could we do the same thing uh, without using the at uh, syntax? So what the at symbol does is really just the same as the following. It takes a function, the greet, and applies the function to it. So um, this at reverse factory that we put on top of the function really just performs this uh, line of code for us after that the function has been defined. And you can see that this is not really a, a lot of work at all, um, but uh, it is a bit simplified in that if I were to do it the second way, I would need to kind of spell out the function name three times here. Um, so by including this syntax, we were kind of just shaving off a little bit of, uh, of typing for us, uh, but it also gives things much more visibility. So it's easier to read essentially that uh, we could hear uh, we are reversing, I guess, typically in decorators, you don't have the factory name there, uh, but you would have something like reverse uh, the greeting and it's kind of clearly on top. While if you would kind of do it the second way around, then uh, the fact that you are reversing is kind of hidden a little bit below. Uh, but uh, these are completely the same. Uh, so for decorators, this is in some sense, the only thing that you need to remember. Um, and um, uh, let's see, uh, yeah. Uh, but typically in your code, you want to have uh, used this syntax. Uh, sometimes when you're just trying to figure out what's happening, it might be useful to kind of unroll it back to this way. Um, th there's a question here, if there's any way to tell a function not to use its decorator. Um, that's uh, a little bit, uh, Yes and no, in a sense. Uh, there's not directly, so I. You know, it, it's hard in, in this case to kind of figure out how to uh, kind of unravel this again. Uh, but we'll, we'll see a little bit later, I'll try to point it out, um, that uh, we will kind of be cleaning up this a little bit uh, where things are a little bit more tidy and then it's possible to get at the functions that are kind of hi hiding below. Um, okay. Uh, so now uh, 
I have been probably talking and writing things a bit too fast, so I, I wanted to slow down a little bit and um, uh, sh show you kind of first exercise to just get your feet wet a little bit. Um, so um, essentially the exercise just asks you to write a decorator that prints the word before, before calling the decorator function and after afterwards. Uh, so, so when we run it, we want it to look something like this, that if I define my greet function with at before and after, then when I run greet PyCon, um, it should print before, uh, sorry, it should print before, and then it should print the high PyCon, then it should print afterwards, after. Um, I'll also, uh, I have just a small Google form where if you want to, uh, you can just post your uh, suggested code to this one and I'll kind of tr try to pick one one of the so solutions and kind of discuss it a little bit. Um, and then just before I let you loose on this, uh, I just want to point out again, uh, what actually made our reverse factory uh, become a, function, uh, no, sorry, a decorator, what really happened there. Um, and the main, or the, really the only thing that uh, it does is that it takes in a function, uh, as you can see here. Uh, so that should be the, essentially the only argument to your decorator should be a function. And then it should return uh, some function again. And what happens is that after you do the decoration, let's see here. So after you do this at reverse factory, what has happened then is that the greet function right there has been replaced by this wrapper function that we kind of have in the middle here. Um, so that, that's kind of more explicit probably here that the greet function has been replaced by whatever is returned from your decorator. So uh, I'll leave this for you now for say about a couple of minutes, two, three minutes. And uh, once uh, you have uh, your uh, code example, uh, just post it here. I'll put this link in the chat so you can find it in the chat. Uh, let's see, I'll just gonna copy it there, I think. So um, yeah, then uh, good luck and looking forward to seeing your uh, examples. So I'll just put this in the chat and then I'll show the uh, exercise again. And yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat or just unmute yourselves. Let's see, I should put this one.
Great, I see a couple of solutions are starting to roll in. Uh, so that's great. And it seems like um, uh, most of you have found, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the way to do it essentially. Um, so let me just show off a solution for this. And uh, uh, what do we do? Uh, as we said, we need the decorator to accept the function as its parameter. And then uh, we have some kind of wrapper function inside. Uh, I tend to just call it wrapper, or you might want to call it something more explicit, like a wrapper before and after, or something like this. But for now, I'll just call it wrapper. Um, that's the function that's actually being called. So it, we wanted to have this text uh, argument. And then I guess we just wanted to print uh, before. Uh, and let's see, then we wanted to call the function, something like this. And then we wanted to print after. And then finally, we just needed to return our wrapper, something like this. Uh, so let's see if that actually works. So then we wanted to do, uh, I want to apply this to my greeter. Where I'll just greet name this and then if we do our usual greeting we can see that it says before high PyCon and after uh, now by, by itself this is of course not a very um, interesting decorator uh, but it does kind of show off um, the, the flow of how decorators work and this is actually something that is a fairly mm, typical uh, organization of, of your decorator. So you'll have you'll have this inner wrapper function. Um, you'll do something before you call the function. You'll call the function. You'll do something after you call the function. Um, so this kind of structure is something that you'll see repeated uh, several times. So I'll just copy over this one. Let's see, that one got... Uh, okay, uh, so there you see the before and after as well. And let's see, um, what happens now if we use this decorator for some other function? Um, so let's say that I have, I'll now create a very advanced function that I'll call adder, which can add two numbers. So um, this one uh, is, of course, I should just be using plus, but maybe I want my own adder function for some reason. Um, and what happens if I try to decorate this one with before and after? So if I now do before and after on top of this, uh, that seems to work. Uh, and let's say I now want to add three and 10 together. Oops, then we actually get an error. Uh, and uh, what it says here is that the wrapper, so that's, remember, uh, let's see here, yeah, we have it over here, the before and after, uh, the wrapper, that's the inner function. So that's really what the adder function is at the moment, takes just one positional argument, but we gave it two. So the one positional argument that it talks about there, is text as we have here. So what we actually did with this before and after was that we really tailored it very much to the print function that, that we have been using in our examples uh, or the greet function or any other that just takes in one string argument. Um, typically for your uh, decorators, you want them to be uh, much more general and, uh, and able to kind of handle most any, any function that makes sense. So how can we do that? Um, there is a concept in Python um, that is called uh, unpacking of um, 
of uh, lists and it, it's used to kind of have uh, an optional number of parameters. Um, so typically it, it will look something like, um, as an example here, uh, the usual uh, name for the arguments that we use here is args and quarks. Um, I'll uh, talk about what those are in a minute, um, but let me just show you how this thing works. Uh, let's see, I want to do this. Um, so my params function here is just printing out its parameters, really. Um, so what I'm doing here, I'm just using a little bit of f string magic that's available in 3.8, that if you throw in an equal sign, you can use it for uh, simple debugging text like this. Uh, so this then prints out what's the value of args, what's the value of quarks that we define here. And you can see, actually, the special thing with these is not their names. Um, so this args here could really be called anything. The special thing is the star in front. And similarly for the quarks, it's the two stars in front. So what do these things do? Uh, so let's say that I have... Uh, something like this instead. So what it does is that it just eats up uh, parameters that you pass into the function. Uh, the ones with the one star, so the args, uh, just takes any of the parameters here that you have not named. So they're just passed in positionally. So you can see one and two passed in here as a tuple. Uh, and then anything that you passed in as name arguments or keyword arguments uh, is stored in kw or quarks um, as a dictionary. But uh, what this does for us is just give us an opportunity to, uh, to, to make our before and after decorator much more general. So uh, let's see. I'll, yeah, I'll just post this one also over here. And uh, then let's see. Um, so if I now want to rewrite my before and after and kind of make it accept any kind of argument, what I can do then is just change my wrapper. So I'll have args and the keyword args, quarks, um, for the wrapper. And then when I call the function, I'll, I'll just call the function with the same args and quarks. Again, with the stars, um, and the meaning of the stars is slightly different in the two cases, essentially. So this, in the first one, when, when they're used, when you define the function, that's kind of collecting the arguments for you. And then down here, it's exploding in the back, um, essentially. But what this allows us to do now is that if I redecorate my adder with this new before and after function, uh, that means that I should now be able to actually uh, call the adder without getting the error that we had earlier. Because now this 3 and 10 uh, are passed into this args, so there'll be a tuple that is then exploded there and then really passed down to our function. So that's definitely much better. Uh, one thing is still missing though. Um, you can see here our adder um, it did the before, it did the after, uh, but the actual return value from adder is lost. And uh, where did the return value go? Well, again, let's see if we can figure this one out. So adder is really just this wrapper function, right? And if we look closely at the wrapper function we have here, we can see that the wrapper doesn't return anything at all. Uh, so what happens then is that it implicitly returns none. So I guess if I were to print my adder, um, you can see here that it prints out none. So because wrapper returns none, that kind of becomes the, the return value of our decorated function. So that's not good. Uh, so we also want to make sure that our decorators, usually at least, uh, return 
uh, the value from the function. So uh, the only thing we need to do then is just make sure that we capture that return value from the function. So I'll uh, go in again and edit my before and after. And in this case, I'll since we're doing something after recalling the function, I want to capture the return value of the function. And then once we're done with our after stuff, I can just pass that return value out like this. So then if I redecorate one more time and run our adder, you can see that it prints out before, it prints out after, and then it returns 13. So, so the output here doesn't really show this, but if let's say I do this instead, then it becomes clear what's happening. You can see it prints out before, it prints out after, and then the result has been returned um, from either. So now we have um, a decorator that can really handle um, most functions at least. It, it will kind of take in any kind of argument and it will uh, return the value from the function. It just does whatever it wants to do before and after it calls the function. So I'll store our latest version of before and after just here out on the right. And then uh, we have a second exercise. And uh, this um, is kind of just to see that we can uh, handle the return values and those kind of things. Um, so essentially it's also hopefully quite straightforward. Uh, it's write the decorator uh, that runs uh, the decorated function twice uh, and then returns a two tuple with both the return values. So in this example that's down here, I call the decorator do twice and I applied it to a function I'll just call roll dice. Uh, which just returns one random integer between one and six. And then you can see if I actually call roll dice now with decorated do twice, um, you can see that I actually get two random numbers. So that happens because the decorator runs my function twice and returns both values here. Uh, so that's exercise two. Um, have, have a go at it. Uh, then I'll give you a couple of minutes. And if you find a good answer, just post it on the Google form that the same, the same link as the previous one.
Uh, yeah, I hope uh, it's you're getting something useful out of this. Uh, so I see a couple of answers are coming in. Um, so let's um, have a look at one of them. So essentially, we want to define a do twice decorator. And uh, let's see how we can do that. So uh, we know the basic checklist. We want to have a function that uh, accepts a function as a parameter. Then inside of this, we want to have a wrapper function that takes in args and quarks. Uh, and then uh, from here, I want to call the function uh, twice and uh, and just return the values. Uh, we could, uh, like we did here with the wrapper, uh, store each of the function return values in a temporary variable and return those. Or in this case, it is also possible to just return directly. Um, so I'll do that in this example. Um, and I guess either approach works uh, uh, works nicely, and um, and we'll. Uh, so it's really just a matter of which one is more readable in a sense. And then the final thing we just need to remember is to return the actual wrapper function. Something like this. Uh, so let's see. Then I can try to apply my do twice to this uh, roll dice function. Uh, that returns a random integer between one and six. And I believe I have not imported random yet, so I'll make sure to do that. And if I now run roll dice, uh, you can see I, even if I only had one integer, uh, I, I get two back. Uh, let's see, there's also a question slash comment. Uh, yes, some of you may not be able to access the Google form. Uh, that's okay. Um, I will, uh, there's also a question here if I'll be sharing the code that I'm pasting, pasting here. Uh, yes, so when, uh, after the after the tutorial, I'll, I'll share all of this code on, um, on a GitHub page that I'll give you the link to um, mm -hmm. so, so that you can see all of this. Excuse me. Um, yep. uh, it is easier for me to speak than to write. Yep, uh, can you explain the line below wrapper on the top? I understand the wrapper. You um, you pass the arguments with args and keywords, but what is the next one does? This one. Yes. Um, yes. So in this one, I'm just calling the function. Uh, with with the same arguments, um, first one time, and then the comma uh, creates a tuple, uh, and then I'm calling it again. So this one just uh, creates, um, it, it calls the function essentially twice, and then passes the result back as a tuple. Uh, it may be easier, uh, let's see, uh, I guess, uh, so what I mentioned was that it's possible to do this uh, something like this instead, uh, that I'll explicitly uh, take the return values. So first, second, uh, like this, and then I'll just return first, comma, second. And then let's see, we just need to delete this one. So something like this. Um, so, so these are really doing the same thing. The first one just cramps everything into one line. Did that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yep, perfect. Good, good. Um, so uh, let's see. Now um, we're, we're getting a hold of these uh, basic decorators, and we're kind of seeing this pattern where we can do something um, with with the function calls we're making. Um, so these decorators, uh, essentially the effect of them happens when you call the function, right? Um, so the the two calls that the do twice creates um, happens when I when I call roll dice, right? And then uh, next time I call roll dice, it does two calls one more time. Um, it is actually also possible to do things with your decorators 
uh, at the moment that you're defining the function. So I'm not calling it, but when you're defining it instead. Uh, so I'll show some example of those. Let's see, I'll just copy this one over there for now. And then um, uh, as a very uh, basic example of this, I guess, um, I'll just uh, create a decorator. I'll just call it define. And what I want this to do is just print out the message that is defining a function. Defining a function, and I'll even here um, add in uh, the name of the function. Uh, so the func dot double underscore name double underscore uh, that actually is able to pick out what the name of the function itself. Um, so so we can print that out to the screen. And what I've said so far is that for um, when we're defining a decorator, we want to take in a function and we want to return a function. And what we have returned so far has been these wrapper functions, right? Like what we're doing in both do twice and before and after. But if we don't want to change the function itself, we're free to return uh, to return that function, the same function back again. Um, so what will this thing do? Um, well, if I use my define decorator, and here I'll just do the same roll dice function that you saw earlier. Uh, I'll be using this roll, roll dice um, in several of these examples. Um, uh, it's just returning some integer. And <clears throat> sorry, uh, what you can see now is that it prints out defining roll dice at the moment I am defining it. So right now, and then if I call roll dice, you can see that it's not printing anything and it, it hasn't changed this function at all because our roll dice, it just passed straight through here, right? So it's, it is the actual roll dice function. Um, so if I look here at the function, it says here that it's, it is the roll dice function. While what we saw earlier, let's see if greet is still here. Yeah. Um, for instance, when we decorated with before and after, we saw that it really changed what seems to be the name of the function here to, to wrapper. Um, we'll soon actually fix this as well. So it looks, these things look nicer. Um, but what um, uh, what we did here is that um, we actually, I guess we didn't change the function at all, but we did something at the moment that we are returning now, defining the function. And that can sometimes be quite powerful as well. And it's also possible to then combine this with changing the function at runtime. Um, but this is typically something that's done, for instance, in um, a Flask, for those of you who know it. It's sort of like when you create web pages and then to, to, sh to define which function that corresponds to which um, endpoints of web pages, um, you use a decorator. And, and that's kind of then just registering th those things so that the server can dispatch correctly later. Um, so, uh, one, uh, to, to do an example uh, of um, another example of, of how to do this, uh, we have a, another uh, exercise. So for our third exercise, um, write a decorator that just stores references to decorated functions into a dictionary. So essentially what we do here is that we, oops, uh, we have a uh, dictionary. Uh, I'll just call it functions here. Uh, empty dictionary I start with. And then I have a decorator that I call the register. And when I apply this to, for instance, this roll dice function, um, nothing changes with the roll dice, uh, but the roll dice should kind of be put into the functions dictionary. So that afterwards, when I look inside the function dictionary, I can see that roll dice, the name of the function, and a pointer to the function itself. And what this allows me to do is something that may not look very powerful, um, but it can actually be extremely useful, uh, is that I can uh, call the function by using the text string roll dice here. So that means that this text string you can get from 
many different places um, and that way be able to uh, to call functions kind of or dispatch to functions sort of like indirectly um, yeah uh, so the exercise so this is really quite similar to what we did for the define decorator um, and I'll just give you a few minutes and then just post them to uh, to the form when you uh, are done Okay, uh, so let's see. Um, it seems like several of you have posted answers on the in the form, and uh, let's have a quick look at how this can work. And there's also a question in the chat about uh, having a small break soon, uh, which I think we all deserve. So after we kind of just reviewed this exercise, we'll have a five minute break. And uh, then, uh, yeah, before I do the review, there's also just a question here about when would uh, a decorator be the most useful? And uh, th they can really be used for many different purposes. Uh, but um, uh, what, what I often find uh, is one of the powers of this is that you, of decorators, is that you can quickly um, add a lot of similar behavior to, to several of your functions. So I think, say, say one of them may be uh, most obvious do something before and after a function is just timing a function. So you can have a timer decorator that just calculates how long does a function run for. Uh, that could be um, useful in depending on your use case. Um, and then you just slap that decorator on top of your already defined functions. Or uh, one very nice example again in the Flask world where you have web pages is that you can have a decorator that just forces uh, or says that uh, forces authentication essentially on certain end routes. So you can say user must be logged in decorator that just checks uh, checks that so that you can kind of move a lot of that behavior out of your functions and kind of just deal with it in one place. Okay, uh, let's see here. We had the, uh, yeah, we had the define um, example there. Now we want to do the register example. Um, it said that we have uh, some dictionary functions, then I wanted to define my register. And similarly to how we did for the define, I don't need to create a wrapper function this time. I don't want to change the function. Uh, I just want to do something when it, if it is defined. In this case, I just want to store a reference to the function into my dictionary. So that could look something like this. And uh, then what it, would it look like if we have our roll dice function? And then 
I run this and now I can look inside of functions and you can see here that I have roll dice and I have a reference to the function itself. That means that I can call it um, something like this. So this gives me the reference and then I can slap on the parentheses at the end to call it. And uh, just as a, I guess, somewhat silly example of, of uh, these kind of things, um, again, so, so one thing, uh, th this kind of behavior is actually quite useful for creating different kind of plugin systems and those kind of things, where you can just say that these certain functions behave similarly and maybe could be called or something like this. Um, just to show uh, probably a silly example of this, uh, is something like this. So I could ask the user, which function do you want to call? And then it asks me here and I say that, yeah, I should have a space there. I want to call roll dice and then later, so I could then do something like this. And then if I want to instead call the function play card. Well, that function hasn't been registered, doesn't exist, right? Um, so this is kind of one way to kind of make things dynamic. Uh, one question, do we really need to return funk there? Uh, yes, we do, although it may not seem like it does much. Um, and what happens there is just that um, when we do the at register here, uh, it replaces this function with whatever is returned from here. So if you don't have a return there, this will be replaced by none. So your function will be none and it can't really be called anything. So the func there is important. Okay, uh, then it's time for a break, I think. Uh, so uh, I think it will be good to, yeah, just stretch a little bit. Um, yeah, since time zones are hard, uh, let's just say that we'll meet again in something like five minutes or something. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so I'll just uh, I'll just add a countdown here, and then you can have a look at that. So we'll meet in about five minutes, and uh, yeah, see you then. Again, if any questions, just post them to the chat or uh, unmute yourselves.
Okay, uh, so that's about five minutes. I'll uh, start, um, I guess, slowly talking again. Um, so first, are there any questions and comments so far? I see so one comment in the chat is um, uh, mostly interested in uh, why more than how. And um, of course, this uh, in, in this um, tutorial, we'll mostly be showing off uh, kind of how, how and how you create decorators. And um, some of the motivation for decorators I briefly touched on in the beginning would be that um, you can um, uh, create quite effective and readable code. And um, uh, then there's also a comment here about um, times it would be great to decorate functions in the code, but you also want to be able to test the individual code without the decorators. Um, and um, uh, that's, as it points out, related to how can you run functions without its decorator. And uh, that's actually something that we will be talking about very soon now. Um, so uh, just to show you one uh, small feature that we haven't really uh, seen yet, is that it's possible to uh, stack several decorators on top of each other. So uh, just to kind of show off uh, quite clearly what's happening, I guess, uh, I could, for instance, stack the do twice decorator twice. Um, and then let's just do our regular roll dice example and um, see what happens here. So now if I roll my dice, you can see that we are getting two pairs of pairs of dice rolls. So essentially what happens is that this first do twice um, creates a new function that then rolls pair of dice. Uh, and that second one on top uh, runs that pair of dice function twice. So therefore we get two pairs of dice. Um, so uh, what really happens here, you, you can kind of also see it if we, uh, if we unroll um, the different decorators. And let me here actually, I'll, I'll use my register and my do twice uh, just to have two different uh, decorators on it. Um, so that it's more clear what happens there. Um, so this, uh, if, if you remember uh, doing the do twice on roll dice call was essentially, so if I just consider the, the lowest one, um, the do twice one, uh, that would look something like this, right? That, that was something we talked about earlier that applying a decorator is essentially just writing this thing. And then if I, apply the register on top of this, that really then comes down to just doing this function call register outside of here. So applying the decorate just like this just means that we're kind of calling these things um, in a chain, so to speak. And this will work since um, the inner decorator here do twice returns a function, which is exactly what the register decorator expects to see. So, so it's always functions that are just being passed through. And let's have a look then at our uh, functions just to see what was registered. And um, uh, what you can see there is that with the do twice function, since that was named the wrapper, um, you can see that the register there picked up the name wrapper instead of the name roll dice. So that means that if I actually call now, functions roll dice, which is kind of what I would expect this thing to be named, you can see that this just returns the one number. It's, it doesn't have the do twice because all the do twice thing was placed there. Uh, and in it, 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 this kind of can cause some subtle problems for us when functions just suddenly change their name because of the decoration. So that's something that we typically don't want. And um, there is uh, 
a way to uh, make sure that this doesn't happen. And uh, that's also actually in the standard library. Um, there is something called, let's see, uh, it's the Funk Tools library. And this one contains, uh, let's see, uh, something called Update Wrapper. Uh, and if I just have a look at this, um, you can see that what this does is that it will update the wrapper function to look like the wrapped function. So that's essentially uh, what we want to do. And th there is a version of the update wrapper that is um, uh, a decorator actually, uh, just called wraps. Uh, you can see here, this is called the decorator factory to apply update wrapper to a wrapper function. Uh, so let's have a look at how we typically will use these things. Uh, so we have our func tools, and then I just um, will redefine my do twice decorator. So let's see, uh, there we have the do twice. Uh, something like this. And now what I want to do is just above the wrapper. So I'll apply the func tools wraps decorator uh, to the wrapper. And this one does something that we haven't talked about how to create this ourselves yet, but we'll see it later. Uh, it actually takes an argument, um, which is the func. And if I do this and then I apply do twice, to my roll dice. Uh, something like this. And now if I look at roll dice, you can see that it actually thinks that it's called roll dice. So in this case, the do twice uh, did not uh, change anything for us. And really what happens there is that this Funk tools wraps here. Um, it takes the wrapper here and it just transfers the names and all the metadata from the funk. So uh, this just makes things look nicer. And this will also actually mean that if we do the, uh, let's see, I'll take my functions uh, dictionary here, I'll just empty it. And then you can see that if I register again, just quickly here, you can see that now it registers as roll dice, which is kind of what we really wanted to do. And then um, uh, there was also the question about how can we undecorate functions? And if you are using the wraps function, uh, it actually has, let's see if we can see it here. Um, uh, it actually adds a wrapped uh, attribute, wrapped like this, uh, and that just points to to the to the actual original function. So uh, having um, uh, ha having this while well, using the function tools wrapped uh, wraps that gives you the wrapped thing. And this is then able to actually call your roll dice the original function. So you can see here that even though I have my do twice applied to roll dice, I can access roll dice wrapped here to, to, to see the original function. Um, so, so this is then one way that you could actually get that your original functions. And uh, using func tools, uh, Funk tools wraps uh, like we do here is really uh, a best practice that you should be doing for all of your uh, all your decorators really. Uh, so, in a sense, uh, we, we should probably go back and fix our earlier decorators to to be using the funk tools wraps as well. Okay, uh, then there is a question of does the ordering of decorators matter and. Um, uh, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, it's uh, usually, or the, the answer, I guess, I, I, is really, I guess, it depends on your decorators. Um, what actually happens is different. 
so uh, let's see if we can, uh, yeah, just to show that to you. Um, let's say that we use our do twice decorator and then we do the before and after decorator. And this time I'll, uh, yeah, I'll do a simple greet. I think is probably easiest to illustrate with. Um, so if we have this, and I now say greet PyCon, uh, you can now see that it um, it does before, then it says hi PyCon, then it says after, then it does again before hi PyCon, and after. And then here, the non non just means the greet function return none twice. Um, so in this case, the before and after is kind of applied first. It's the inner one. Um, and then the whole before and after greeting uh, is run twice, right? Uh, if I now change the order of these, so I have before and after at the top, and then do twice. And then I can do the same greet. something like this and then we do our greeting uh, you can now see that um, here it says before once and then it, we get the hype icon twice and then after at the end so now you can see the do twice is kind of uh, applied in the beginning so whether uh, whether the order really matters uh, depends a little bit on on what the, uh, what the decorators do um, in this case, since they're both printing, or so, so you see that there will be some effect of it. Uh, so it's usually a good idea to think about what you're doing. Uh, but if there's sort of like just things like, say, if I did the at define and then the at register um, uh, thing, for instance, uh, in this case, the order doesn't matter because the, what they do couldn't uh, couldn't really uh, what do you say? Uh, that doesn't really interact with each other. Um, yeah, so the function is piped from bottom to top, I guess is one way to think of it, or uh, that you kind of have the, the clo closest one is kind of applied first. Uh, if, if you kind of are used to, say, ma mathematical uh, functions, it, it's kind of the same, the same way as you typically would, uh, would uh, yeah, think of mathematical functions applying. Okay, uh, then let's see. I think we have uh, the important things here. And uh, now we have a, a new exercise. And uh, this time, uh, uh, so this is another uh, decorator that, that we'll be playing around with a little bit. Um, it's again one that may seem somewhat silly with the examples that we have, uh, but it is actually has a couple of uses which are really, really useful. And it's uh, something that is a retry um, decorator uh, that just repeatedly calls uh, a function uh, as long as that function raises an exception. Uh, so, so to kind of have something simple to play with here, um, I just created a very stupid dice roll uh, function that can only roll sixes. And if the random dice roll is not six, it raises an error. Uh, and uh, with if we apply the retry to this, that means essentially that the function will just keep rolling the dice until it gets a six and then it will return that six. Um, now, how, how would this be useful in, in a more proper setting? Um, typically, you, you, you can see this if you have a, uh, resources that are somewhat unre unreliable. So if you're kind of doing, say, uh, a call to a server and that server is not really reliable, maybe instead of uh, raising an exception, you just want to retry uh, later. Um, for what we'll be doing here, we'll not worry about things like um, uh, uh, pull, pulling back on, on our calls and things like this. We'll just keep, keep calling it. But typically, you'd also maybe ha have some sleep things inside your retry and so on. Okay, uh, but uh, this one then um, was 
probably be the, the hardest exercise yet. Uh, but the idea here is, can we create a decorator uh, that can repeatedly call the decorated function as long as it raises an exception? Uh, yeah, it will take a couple of minutes. And if you have any suggestions, just post them to, to the Google form. And if you have any questions, just post it in the chat or unmute yourselves. Okay, uh, yeah, so we're getting a few answers rolling in on the uh, form. So let's uh, sh show them uh, off here. So let's see. Um, so for the retry, uh, I'll just start now. We're kind of get getting used to the boilerplate here. Um, so I want to have a function. Uh, I'll throw in the uh, reps. To it and then we'll have a wrapper with the args and quarks. Okay, and then we need to start to think a little bit. Um, but essentially, here now uh, we want to keep repeatedly calling. Uh, so, one way to do that would just be to uh, start a while loop. So, I'll just say that I'll forever do something. Um, and then I want to make sure that I'm able to pick up when an exception happens. So that means that I'll start a try accept block. And uh, now I guess I can just try to return uh, the function uh, call with the args and the quarks. So if, if there is no exception, this will then just call the function and return the value from it. So that kind of takes care of that part. And then what if there is an exception? Uh, well, then we want to accept something for here. I'll 
I'll just uh, take in the base class exception, which um, essentially stops on any exception, um, except a few things like uh, keyboard interrupts and things like this. And if there is an exception, I don't really want to do anything. I just want to have the while loop go back again. So I can do something like this. And then let's see, now I just need to figure out how far back I need to go there to have the return wrapper match up. Uh, so something like this should do the job. Uh, let's try it. Um, so then let's retry. Uh, then we had this kind of silly dice roll that only rolls sixes. And in this case, I'll take my die roll. And if it isn't a six, I'll raise uh, an error. And I'll, I'll just add the number to the error just for uh, documentation, I guess. Uh, and then I'll return whatever number survives. And we can see here that if I only roll sixes, uh, you can see that I got six and this is, is random. Let me just do it a couple of times just to ensure ourselves that it actually only rolls sixes. And uh, just to kind of pay attention a little bit to what's happening there, uh, I also want to just add in, instead of just passing at the exception here, I'll just make it visible what's really happening there. Um, so instead of pass, I'll just print uh, retrying, and then I'll just post the error message like this. Uh, so if I reapply our only roll sixes, uh, then we can kind of see that the function actually does what we thought it would be doing, like this. Okay, uh, so to have an example of where this maybe uh, can look a tiny bit more useful than, uh, than here, let me just copy this over first. Um, one thing that we can do with, uh, with something like the retry decorator is that we can create our own um, uh, very simple sort of like a po polling system that kind of say, say go and check is, is a file available and then when when the file becomes available it, it can do something with it. Um, for, for this kind of application we really should have some kind of sleep as well before we retry, but uh, for this quick demo, I'll just uh, throw it in here. Uh, so say that I want to process some file at a path. And uh, for now, my process of the file will just be that I'll print it out. Uh, and I assume here that this path is, come, is a path lib path, uh, for those of you who know about those. So that's just in the standard library. Um, and uh, then I can call here with a pathlib path where I just wanted to read a file that I call pycon.txt. And what we can see here now is that uh, immediately I get a lot of errors here saying that there is no such file or directory. Uh, I'll just stop it there for uh, now and let's let me briefly just have a quick look at where I am. Yes, that's where I thought I was. Um, okay, uh, so now if we have this pycon.txt there, and then I can create here a new file that I'll call pycon.txt, and then we can go back to our um, window here and we can see that it then stopped and it did process my actually empty file. Uh, so maybe to show this off better, uh, let me say hi everyone here in my pycon.txt and then I'll do the process file on my pycon2.txt. So now again the pycon2 file doesn't exist. And if I go here and I rename it and let's actually 
is if we can make so that we can see both windows at the same time. Uh, I rename this now to PyCon2. And once I rename it, you can see down here that it's able to say, hi, everyone. So, so it's able to start processing the file when the file appears. And uh, uh, of course, this should, should be done much more uh, carefully, I guess, in terms of not overloading the system and so on. Uh, but you can see how our a very simple process, uh, process file function uh, suddenly gains a lot of power just by slapping this retry on top of it. And one thing I just want to yeah, uh, point out is that there is a library uh, that's called um, Tenacity that you can just in pip install, uh, pip install Tenacity. Uh, I'll, I'll add a link to this one as well with the, uh, with the course notes later. Um, but the Tenacity has a retry decorator uh, that does exactly what we have been doing, except that it also can do a whole host of other things. Um, so, so you can kind of tell it when to stop and how much delay and those kind of things. So, so if this is something that looks useful to you, then definitely check out the Tenacity uh, library. Okay, let's just get this thing back in order. Uh, let's see here. Um, so we have our retry there. I guess I'll just post this retry example as well. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah. Other examples where you could use retry would be things like um, if you have. Um, uh, yeah, flaky connections I mentioned. If, if you're getting user input, um, one, I guess I can just show here. So say that I'm getting something that I want to be a number um, from the user. So I'll just think that it, it should be an integer. And then I'll input something like this. How old are you? Um, and now if I call my get age, uh, so if we say something like 12 there, you can see that it returns 12 nicely. Um, if I say something that's not really a number, uh, then you can see here that the retry kicks in and it just asks again. So not the greatest user interface, but it's, it's a very simple way to kind of get some kind of feature like that. Uh, okay, uh, then let's see, uh, now I have a new exercise here, which I, I've labeled hard. And uh, in a sense, I don't really expect you, unless you've already seen decorators, to be able to implement this uh, because it kind of uh, requires a whole new, new idea that we haven't discussed yet. Uh, but what we want to do here is be able to add in uh, a parameter to, to our decorator. So how do we define, I guess we saw this with the wraps decorator, right, that it can take a parameter. So how do we define decorators that take parameters? And in this example, uh, we're using this uh, parameter just to be able to specify that retry should only retry uh, on certain exceptions, so not all, all kinds of exceptions. So in this case, I'm doing a, a calculation that sometimes will also raise a zero division error, which will then be able to pass through. Essentially, it will not be retried on. So um yeah you don't necessarily need to try to implement this but if anyone has any ideas about how, how should we get started kind of what uh what would kind of be the general idea for uh adding uh parameters to decorators and uh, one kind of small hint here is kind of what does this uh, kind of remember the syntax what what this kind of this thing up here, what, what is it, how is it applied? And if you have an answer, just throw it in the chat or unmute yourselves. Or if you have uh, implemented code, feel free to throw it on the, on the um, uh, Google Forms. And yeah, I'll not wait for 
couple couple of minutes here. So if you have any ideas, just throw them out. Otherwise, I can kind of. So I guess yeah. we could use something like star arcs, star quarks um, in the decorator itself. Uh, yeah, or uh, in, in the um, so the star arcs kind of gives us the possibility to take in any kind of parameter. In this case, we we kind of want to fix parameters, but when you say in the decorator itself, I think that that's a good good clue there. Uh, so, so how do we define the decorator? Yeah, so maybe apart from function, we should give like one more argument. Let's say I don't know the order in which it needs to be specified. I mean. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're definitely onto something. And let's see. Actually, instead of uh, one extra argument, what we actually need is even one more level of nesting. So uh, let's see. So if I have something like, let's see, what did I uh, write? I had something like this, right? And some calculation. Uh, here, and then this did something. Uh, let's wait, we'll kind of figure out what that is. Um, and what this actually means now is that this whole thing, the retry value error is, is our decorator. So that means that, uh, or I guess technically the, uh, the retry with, without the at sign. Um, so this thing is what we have usually considered being a decorator, uh, which means that that should be a function. Uh, so that means actually that what I need here is I need to define my retry to take in this exception parameter. Um, and then my retry should then return. So what I get from calling retry should be the actual decorator. So I will then have a decorator inside of here which is the one that takes the function. And then inside of there again, we'll have the func tools wraps of func, and then we'll have our wrapper with the usual args and quarks. Uh, and then this will do something. Uh, I'll leave that blank for now. And then we'll kind of return the wrapper. And then in the next level here, we'll return the decorator. Um, so, so this is definitely a way to make your head spin, right? Um, we, we somehow ended up with three levels of nesting. Uh, but what if we're staring at this a little bit, you can see that what we have inside of here, that's just our usual recipe for creating a decorator. And then what our retry function now becomes, which we still kind of want to talk about, uh, calling it the decorator, but it's now really a decorator factory that creates decorators, um, depending on, on the parameters typically. Um, uh, so this one will then start returning also a function, but this time the decorator function. So uh, it kind of all makes sense if you're keeping your uh, uh, yeah, able to keep things apart, but it's definitely extremely easy to start confusing yourselves with this. And um, uh, if you're kind of uh, wanting to create these kind of decorators, um, it, it usually helps to kind of build them a little bit like we did here from, from the inside out some, some and, and there are also um, some libraries that can help you. So there is a library called Decorators, I believe, that kind of helps a little bit with keeping these things straight. Um, okay, but uh, then to kind of just... Uh, just a small question here. Yeah. So, um, yeah. somehow I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think that, would it make sense to have two decorators here? One is retry and one is somehow another decorator which filters out all other exceptions. Um, and uh, only allows, like earlier we had two levels of decorator, if you remember, like uh, define mm -hmm. and then do twice. I'm thinking like uh, we could have something like that. I mean, essentially we are doing the same thing here, but just within one block. Right. Uh, yeah, so it would be something like, let's see if we can do this. And then you said something like filter value error or something like this. 
something like that. Um, yes, I guess that's one way that possibly could make this work. Uh, the challenge with this is that then essentially we'd need to create these these filter decorators for for each of the different parameter values that we can have. So by allowing the parameters kind of gives us much more power than what you would be able to do with uh, this kind of um, setup. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and uh, let's see, I'll just, uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, uh, then there's also a question. So what would be the long form version of this uh, retry value error thing? Uh, so let's see if we can kind of spell that out. Um, so the question is essentially, if I have this retry value error thing, how does this look when I type it out like this? And actually what would happen there is that we have our decorators, which is this, and then that is applied on calculation. So you can see it, it's, um, it's different from how it was when we stacked the decorators in that here we have, this is the, fun, the factory that returns to the decorator and then that decorator is applied to the function. Uh, okay, uh, so let's see how this actually this retry, how, how can we now uh, implement it? Uh, so we had come this far and essentially now I can more or less just take, let's see, we have it here on the left-hand side, um, the same code that we used for our retry earlier. Uh, so I'll do while through, I'll do a try. I'll try to return my function with the args and the quarks. And let's see, like this. And then I'll accept, but now instead of just having the base exception there, I can use the parameter. So exception here now with the small, uh, small e. And then I'll, I'll do the same printing here, I guess. Retrying. Something like this. And then afterwards, yeah, we have the return wrapper, we have our return decorator, yeah. So this should then be enough. Uh, so let's try it. So if I retry the value error at this somewhat weird calculation, uh, which was that it took a number, and this time I use numbers from negative five to five, mainly just so that zero is in there. And then I'll uh, do a check that if the absolute value of one over the number is greater than 0 0.2, so this is mainly just meaningless, but just gives us something that sometimes raises a value error, sometimes raises a zero division error, and sometimes don't raise an error. Um, so if I have some kind of code like this, that essentially the takeaway is that sometimes it works, sometimes it raises some error that we can ignore, sometimes it raises an error that we shouldn't ignore. Okay, uh, so what will be the effect of calling this? Uh, in the first example, I got the zero division error. And then next time you can see here that it's retrying on a lot of numbers before it finally gives me negative five. Um, try again, now it gave me five and so on. And there sometimes the zero division error passes through. So all in all, um, it seems like we were able to do this. Uh, let's see, so then I'll copy this code over so that you can see it there. And let's see, uh, then we can do uh, another exercise. So this is kind of now, um, giving you a chance to essentially just adapt what we did here uh, to, to use a different um, uh, a different parameter. And um, I'll, let's see. Um, 
yeah, I'll copy this code over so you can have both this and the and the and the code that we did for uh, for the previous retry on the same screen. Uh, but the idea here is essentially that we just want to instead of having this exception as parameter, I want to have max retries or maximum number of retries as the parameters. And um, what it should do is that it will only retry at most max retries times. Uh, so that when you do this only roll sixes, it will sometimes, it will return six, but sometimes it will um, end up um, uh, not getting a six in three tries. So it will return a value error instead. And uh, this is uh, essentially a fairly simple uh, just adaption of what you've seen already. Uh, but then a challenge, which I think for now, you can probably just think about how you can make. Uh, make work is can you have this retry count the retries across several function calls so essentially if the first one doesn't or only does one retry then you can try it again but then it now it only has two retries left and so okay uh, so then I'll give you a couple of minutes to try this one out I'll copy this code uh, over to the um, let's see I have it uh, here, I guess, uh, exercise six. There we go. Um, so I'll copy this one here. Oh, yeah, it, it looks slightly weird, but that should be okay. Um, so then here you can probably see both the things you need. Um, yep. Yeah. So again, uh, if you find something, post it on the forums or questions in the chat. What should it return if it uh, exhausts maximum number of tries? Uh, we can't, I can't hear you. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah you, you can choose, I guess uh, it is possible to just raise the error or uh, you could also just return none. Either way works fine.
uh, yeah, let's see. Then um, a, a couple of uh, people have posted their solutions, and it seems like uh, uh, some nice uh, solutions there. Um, so let me just show um, one of them. And essentially, I guess, yeah, we have this. Um, yeah, this code doesn't or currently throws us an error because I haven't defined my retry with max retries yet. Uh, so let's try to do that. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll just change what we had here on the left-hand side for the exception. Uh, so let's see, first, I want to have max retries here as a parameter. And that means that this exception, I'll just change it back to capital E exception. Uh, and then the, the big change now is that instead of just looping infinitely here, uh, we want to change this for a loop that just goes uh, a given number of times. So I'll just loop over max retries. And essentially then this uh, should more or less do the job for us. So let's have a look at that. Uh, at least now it uh, runs. And if I call only roll sixes, you can see here that it retries three times. And in this case, it didn't get a six, so it just returned nothing to me. Um, this case, I got the six. Uh, one way in this case, if we wanted to kind of uh, just um, send the error that we're getting, uh, further on, so let uh, let the code deal with it later. Uh, we could do essentially something like this: that when we get to the end of the for loop, uh, so that will be there, I guess. Um, I'll just call the function one more time, uh, like this, and. Now it essentially just comes down to what do we mean by retries, whether I should subtract one or not from the max retries there. Um, so if I think about retries strictly as, as retries, then I think this does the correct counting. Um, and uh, I can see here that in this case, I got the six on my three tries. Well, here it tries three times and then on the kind of on the third retry, so the first try and then the third retry, um, I get the value error. But if I kind of want this to actually be three calls, then I just need to subtract one there. Okay, uh, so that's one way we could do this. Um, and then the challenge that I kind of posted at the and here, let's see, there we go. Can we make this retry count the retries across several function calls? So essentially, can we keep keep a state? Um, and um, I'll, uh, that, that will then kind of be the, 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 the last thing that we'll kind of uh, try to do here is see how can we work with state and decorators? And we have already actually seen uh, one way to to do this kind of state thing. Um, we could do something like we did for register, right? Where we just have a separate uh, dictionary, maybe something like uh, this. And uh, then we could have this, um, uh, have, have our, re sorry, have our decorator um, store its number of retries that are kind of left uh, in that dictionary and update it. Uh, but that kind of gets very messy with this external dictionary that is really just something that's internal to the decorator. Um, so a better way to, to take care of that kind of state is that we can store information about the state on the, on the decorator function itself, actually. Um, and that's actually what you saw briefly with our, uh, let's see, with this wrapped uh, thing that we had there. Uh, uh, sorry, not on do twice, but on, uh, well, I guess we could do on the roll sixes. Only roll sixes. Um, then then here, here we have actually stored something on an 
on an attribute on the on the decorator. Uh, so, so we can kind of take this idea and, and roll with it a little bit. Uh, so let me just first take my, let's see, this one, and I'll just paste it in here so we have it. And now I want to add statefulness to this one a little bit. Um, so what I can actually do here is that I can, on the wrapper itself, let's see, so if I come down here, uh, I have now defined this function, and then I'll just, here, uh, I'll add in a parameter uh, on it or an attribute. Uh, so I'm just storing the value zero on it. And just to show you what happens there, if we run this now, uh, I have my only roll sixes, uh, which is this function. And now it has an attribute on it, um, num retries that I defined here. So I define the wrapper function, and then I just claim that this wrapper function has an attribute that I want to call num retries, and it should have the value zero. And then I return it. And only roll sixes is just wrapper in hiding, so to speak. Uh, what can I now do with this uh, is that I can uh, have a look at, let's see, uh, whenever I retry, I can increase it. So I can do wrapper num retries plus equals one. Uh, so that means that now I'm counting the number of retries that we're doing in the function. And then finally, I could here, when I say that how many retries do you have left? Well, that's the maximum number minus the number that you've already been doing. So I can do something like this. And now I can do the retry, only roll sixes, and to have something that's a little bit more fun to play with, let's say that we get 10 retries. So now if I do the only rule sixes function, uh, I got a six on the first tie, good. And then we can see there's a couple of retries. Oh, there's many retries. So how many retries have we done so far? Only rule sixes dot number of retries. We've done nine. So now it should only have one retry left. And there we can see it did the retry and then it raises the value error because it didn't get a six. And then if we're lucky at some point to actually roll a six, but now we need to do it on the first, then it returns it. So uh, this is one way that you can define state on, uh, on your decorators. Let's see, let me just move this over. And in, for certain use cases, this is more than adequate. Um, and um, it, it is kind of so, somewhat powerful idea that you're storing storing state, storing attributes on the on, on the functions or on the objects that are using them. Of course, um, one th there is uh, something that is kind of designed to store state, and that's classes. And in Python, of course, we can use classes. And um, here's something that I guess. I guess I haven't completely lied, but I haven't told you the full truth about uh, what decorators are. I've kind of been claiming that they were functions that take in a function and return a function, but actually it can be anything that you can call, uh, can be used as a decorator. And uh, functions um, can be made callable. Uh, so you can use functions as decorators. And just to give you an example of how something like that would look, uh, if you remember our before and after um, uh, decorator, uh, we, we can try to rewrite something like this using a class. And um, what I want to do then, I'll just use the before and after. Uh, so I used the uh, kind of camel case there to show it's a class. And now uh, we kind of need to think a little bit about the notation here, right? So what it does um, 
first, kind of when you, if we apply this as a decorator, it will take before and after and send in function to it essentially. So that means that the constructor of our class will get the func. So that means that I'll uh, do the init and then I'll get a func here. Um, so yeah, if any of you haven't been playing with classes before, I'm I guess I'm so, sorry I don't have time to go into more detail about how classes work, uh, but then yeah, just feel free to uh, come along for the ride. But um, essentially, uh, this init is a special method on, on any class that is kind of the constructor. So what happens when you create an instance of a class? And in this case, um, we, we need to kind of remember uh, the function uh, because we want to use it later. So I'm just storing it on an instance attribute that I'll call self.func like this. And then uh, what actually happens now when we, if I do the uh, use before and after as a decorator is that my function will be replaced by this class because it's, or it's replaced by an instance of this class that is kind of constructed from init. And then when the function is called, what happens with classes is that it calls the special call method. Uh, so this uh, kind of takes place of our arcs and quarks thing, or our wrapper, I guess. Um, so we'll have something like this. And then here I can now do my print of before. I'll have the value equals and now I need to re refer to the func, so that's now stored a reference to it itself. So self func, uh, args and quarks. And then I'll do my after job. And finally, I'll just return value from this. And the one thing that I guess now we're, we're essentially equivalent to what we have on top here, uh, but just to show you one more thing is I talked about this func tools wraps. Uh, that doesn't quite work for classes, but we can instead do func tools, the update wrapper. So I briefly mentioned this and how the func tools wraps is really just a shortcut for calling update wrapper. And this takes in then um, what should be updated and what should it be updated with? So like this. And then just to show that this works, let's do our good old greeter. So something like this, sprint, I name it. And now if I greet my PyCon, we see that we get the before we get high PyCon and we get after. So uh, if you want to have a state, then storing that state in a class is, is really um, quite, quite useful and quite efficient and in a sense, much cleaner than um, kind of the hoops that we went through with this number e tries here. Uh, so our final exercise for today uh, will be uh, implementing a version of retry where we're using a class to store state. And um, uh, before I kind of jump over to that, one small thing I'll just point out here, that's a small difference. Um, uh, and we had this as a question earlier, right? That uh, in your decorator, you always need to return the function. And you can see here when we do the class before and after, there is no return of the function. The only thing I'm returning here is the, the value. And uh, what happens there is that when we do this, um, instead of this kind of replacing it with the return value from a function, it re replaces it with whatever the init thing does. Or you, you can think of if I do before and after of some function, uh, then this becomes the object that is kind of then replaced. Uh, this thing is replaced with. And um, you can see here that this greet, when we type it like this, it's kind of clear that this is just passed in here as a function that is then stored there and then used here to do the call. Um, one small thing that uh, you can 
uh, notice here is that if I look at the type of greet, you can see that this is a class. Well, if I look at the type of, let's see, something that we had earlier, so roll dice, uh, something that was decorated with a regular decorator, that is still a function. So when you're decorating with a class, you're actually replacing a function with a class, which may sometimes bring problems. But usually, uh, this doesn't really matter. OK, uh, then let's see. What was the final challenge? Um, so essentially, uh, write a class-based retry decorator that keeps track of the number of retries across all function calls. Uh, so this is slightly different from what we did earlier in that I don't include the, the extra hassle of parameters here. Um, so this will kind of just count the attempts. It will not have a max retries. Um, so just can we make a class-based retry that just keeps track of the number of retries across function calls? And I think for this, it's probably most helpful to actually see the, uh, see the before and after example. So I'll think I'll stick with this page um, here and add in the, this class example over here. And yeah, I can, I guess I can copy this one. And yeah, uh, okay. Uh, so we'll take a couple of minutes and if you have any questions, reach out in the chat or unmute yourself. And if you have a solution, post it on the forums or the Google forums.
Okay, uh, seeing some answers pop in, uh, so that's great. Um, there's also a question about the need for uh, wraps or update wrapper. And um, uh, just very briefly, uh, I can show an example afterwards, but those are, um, what, what they do is that they make your decorated function kind of look, get, get the right metadata instead of getting the metadata from this decorator function. So the, that was kind of what we saw that um, uh, function names became wrapper instead of the actual function name and things like this. Okay, uh, so let's see how we can actually implement uh, the retry class. And we have a couple of nice, uh, uh, nice examples here. Uh, so essentially uh, we can do pretty much just the same structure as this before and after. Uh, but the main difference here was that we also then wanted to capture the state of the number of retries that we've done. Uh, so I'll take the constructor. Uh, the constructor will get passed in uh, the function from the, uh, from the decorator. I'll apply this update wrapper so that it looks nice and actually yeah, let me wait with this one then. I can demo that what happens if we don't have it. Um, so I'll add that one later. Uh, cell func, I store a reference to it. And then I wanted to also store the state of how many tries have we had done so far. Uh, or sorry, number of tries. Um, so I'll just store this as a completely regular um, class instance variable or instance variable on a class this time um, instead of doing these attributes that we played around with earlier. And then we have our call. So uh, here you can kind of see uh, possibly even clearer uh, the difference between uh, define time of, of a decorator and call time in that whatever is in init happens when you define a function. And then whatever is in call is what happens when you call the function afterwards. Um, and in this case, um, we just wanted to do essentially the same kind of thing as the other retry that we now we go back to looping infinitely. And then I'll try to return the self func uh, args and quarks. Uh, so again, we just need to remember that we uh, have kind of put this reference to the function on self so we can find it there. And then if there happens to be some exception when we call it, I'll do a small log again so that we can kind of see what happened. Um, and in this case, I'll actually do the num retries. Like this, I add one to number of retries and then I can print out, uh, yeah, retry attempt. And then we have the self memory tries. And like this. Uh, okay. Uh, so let's see. How can we now use this? I can then do, uh, essentially I do at retry let's do this on the top of the screen. Um, then we define the only roll sixes function. And let me just quickly get that one back up here. There we go. Um, so only roll sixes. I take a random number. If it's not six, I raise a value error. And if I now do only roll sixes, and I can see here, if I look at it, you can see that this is now a retry object. Um, so, so this is essentially because we didn't do the um, update wrapper. Then this has kind of changed its name. We, we're seeing the decorator bleed through here, but we can here now see that the number of retries is zero. And then if we run it, we can see it's still zero because we 
through a six on the first try. But there we get a couple of new retry attempts. So now we're up at three retry attempts. And then here you can see we needed several attempts before we got to six and so on. So one thing to just point out here is that we are a, in fact keeping state, right? We counted the three first one, and then on the next time here we count from four and so on. So uh, with this class we are able to keep our state. And then just to show you now, if I go back and edit, uh, so now I add in the func tools, update wrapper, with self and func, and then we look at this. So remember, before I did this change, only roll sixes thinks that it's a retry object. But now if we uh, redefine this, now only uh, rel sixes still thinks it's a retry object. Let's see what happened there. Only rel sixes. I'm getting confused. Um, okay, I may need to debug this offline. So what should have happened here um, is that this only roll sixes should think that it's only roll sixes. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I'll need to take a look at that offline then probably instead of wasting our time now. Um, at least that's what it should be doing. Um, okay, uh, that kind of brings us to the end here. And so I'm gonna, uh, let's see, go back here and uh, just to kind of round things up a little bit. Um, uh, there, there are some resources, so I'll send you all a message after the course uh, with uh, some of these links, and then I'll post the code that you have been seeing fly by here on um, on this GitHub page that you can see here. So essentially, uh, I have the GitHub page. Um, that's my GitHub decorators tutorial. And I did a similar tutorial last year, um, but that was just a pure, uh, video, not an interactive course like this time. Uh, so you can find all the material and the video from the 2020 course at uh, the same page. Um, it kind of covers more or less the same things, but with different examples uh, and so on. So if there's some things that you felt maybe weren't quite uh, well explained this time around, maybe it was better last year and so on. Um, I'll also then add in uh, some code from this year uh, onto this page. Uh, then I also have a couple of links here to real Python. Uh, so let me just move over here. And um, uh, I'll just mention that um, I do some work for real Python where I have been writing some tutorials and I have also been working as an editor for some other tutorials. So real Python is a site where you can find tons of uh, written tutorials about Python. Um, all of the written tutorials are freely available. Uh, so you can just go to realpython.com and see them. And for instance, there is one on decorators that you can uh, find on the link I gave you. That's what I have. You'll be able to see a lot of the concepts that we have been discussing here. Uh, you could also just search uh, here in the search bar for decorators uh, and you'll find the same article. Um, there is also a video course uh, called Python Decorators 101, which is really based on, on the article and kind of covers the first half of the article. Um, in a sense, I guess there's nothing in, in that video course that you haven't already seen. Um, but if you're interested, feel free to sign up for that one. So video courses on real Python uh, do require uh, a subscription. So, uh, so that you know that. Uh, and then yeah, I see Ben just mentions that um, this uh, tutorial will also be posted on the YouTube channel. Um, finally, there's a couple of links here. One is kind of to the uh, holy grail almost of uh, of the creators, the, the PEP 
so if you're not familiar with PEPs, these are essentially the official documents of the Python language. Uh, so PEP means uh, Python Enhancement Proposal. Uh, you can see this one goes all the way back to 2003, uh, but this was when decorators were defined and introduced into the language. Um, so if, if you kind of want to have the real technical um, background, you can have a look at this thing. Uh, then there is a great awesome list um, that kind of covers some Python decorators. Um, I'll, let's see, I have it here. Um, and um, first of all, it kind of shows off um, the peps up here. You can kind of have a look at them. Um, it, there's also uh, a little bit of wikis that kind of uh, have, have some cool examples. Uh, then it lists, I guess this was a question early on, uh, if we're if there is a list of, uh, of decorators. Uh, so, so these are, I believe, at least most of, if not all of the decorators that are in uh, built into Python or in the standard library. So here you can see, for instance, the LRU cache that we did uh, early, early example of. There's the Funk Tools wraps that we have been using. Um, and if you've been using, um, uh, doing any object-oriented stuff before, then there's the class method, properties, and things like this. Um, then there's also decorators that are kind of in other uh, libraries that are outside of the standard library. So here's also a list of those. Um, this decorator library is uh, quite good if you, it gives you kind of a simpler way of writing some of the decorators, so that can be useful. Uh, Flask is a great example of um, of using decorators. Uh, we have tenacity somewhere. There is the retry uh, decorator we mentioned earlier and so on. So um, uh, yeah, have a look at those. And then finally, let's see. Um, I'll also just point to uh, this article here on real Python. That's also one that I wrote um, where it, it's all about timing code really, but um, it, it also touches on how you can use the decorator as a timer and how decorators place in together with something called context management and those kind of things. So that kind of brings us to the end here. Uh, so I'll kind of just end then with saying, thank you so much for your participation. I hope you found it useful. And uh, it was a lot of fun to see uh, the, the code that you posted here. I'll, as I said, I'll post all this material onto the GitHub and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out at my email address, um, kdarn.gmail.com.